Hey everyone, I appreciate you taking the time to watch this video documenting my build of the largest and fanciest cutting board I've ever made. I started out here with 8 quarter roughs on walnut, which is just a technical way of saying it's 2 inches thick. Here's a front view where you can see the length of the board, and with it being roughs on, it's really hard to see the true color and grain, but I can tell it's really clear of defects, which is hard to find with walnut, so I was excited to get to work. Here you can see I've made some measurements on the ends where I'll eventually cut it into more manageable strips on the table saw. I then make some rough lengthwise measurements to about 25 inches and mark that in white pencil, which is much easier to see on the dark walnut versus using a regular pencil. I then use a combination square to mark the length of that cut and use my miter saw to make the cuts. I'm not a huge fan of the miter saw for more precise and final cuts on finer projects like this, but it's great for these initial rough cuts to get things to length. And here are the boards now in more manageable size pieces. I then take the boards to my joiner and simply put this machine will just put one flat face on each board by taking off the high spots on each pass until it's all flattened out. With one flat face I can now take the boards to the table saw and rip them to those strips that I made lines for earlier. Here it looks like I'm being dangerous on the saw because the clip is sped way up, but I always take an abundance of caution with any of these tools and always look for the safest and most efficient way to accomplish a task. I also always use eye protection, ear protection, and almost always use a dust mask as well. The reason I'm cutting these larger pieces into strips is because by doing so and rotating the boards, I'll get more consistent and straighter grain lines on the final glue up which will make the final board look like one cohesive piece of walnut. Additionally, rotating these strips will help stabilize the seasonal movement of the board and will help keep it flatter over time. And here you can see the strips in their correct orientation and you can really see those straighter grain lines and start to see how the board will end up looking. I then make marks in white pencil on the ends of the strips to note which faces will end up being the top and bottom. I'll now take those strips to my planer which will essentially thickness the strips to the same dimensions. I'm actually planing the sides of the strips, not the tops and bottoms, so that I'll get a uniform and smooth glue surface when it comes time to glue all these together. You can see similar to the joiner, the planer takes off the high spots, and then I'll just keep lowering the cutter head until they're all thickness to the same dimensions. And with that I can line up the boards and see that all the glue surfaces are looking great. You can really see now what I mean that in this orientation the strips will make the final product look like one solid piece of walnut. Now I go through strip by strip marking which board will go in which order. I do that poorly out of frame here. There's still some variation in color and grain for each strip and I want to orient them so that two different looking pieces don't end up going next to each other in the final glue up. And with that it's time to go on to the first glue up. I had two different options here. First I could take all 13 strips and glue them up at once. This initially seems like it would take less time, but I knew it would take way more time on the back end after the glue up to smooth out the whole board. My planer can only accommodate boards up to 12 and a half inches wide, and this cutting board will ultimately end up being 20 inches wide, so it would be too wide for the planer, and I ignored this option. So instead, I decided to do the glue up in two phases. First, I glued up each half so that I could run each through the planer and thickness them again together. In this way, it would be simpler for the final glue up to only have to manage gluing two pieces and keeping them flat and coplanar versus managing 13 strips at once. This will make more sense visually in a minute here. I'm using Type Bond 3 here to glue the strips together. Type Bond 3 is the brand's most water resistant PVA option, so I always make sure to use it when I'm building things like cutting boards that will see lots of time exposed to water. As I'm gluing these boards up, I'm getting good clamping pressure and consistent glue squeeze out across the length of the strips. I'm also checking with a ruler to make sure the board is flat enough across the width. This doesn't have to be perfect because it'll go through the planer again, but I just don't want any strips super far off from each other or to have the board as a whole cupping. Once the glued up halves are dry, I then run them through the planer again to thickness them. I made marks in that white pencil across the surface to make it very visually clear to myself where the planer is taking off material and where it still needs to remove more. I then make multiple passes lowering the cutter head until all the white marks are gone. With that complete I can now glue up the two halves. Here you can see how it's a lot easier to manage one glue seam versus over a dozen. Again I get adequate glue coverage and equal clamping pressure to show me that there are no gaps and I'll have a good bond between the two halves. 
I wipe off the initial glue squeeze out, and now I'm using what are called calls for this glue up. Essentially, these calls are just straight edged pieces of wood that act as braces to keep the two halves completely in line with each other. I then clamp the two calls on each side together to force the boards into perfect alignment. The calls are covered in packing tape so that they don't end up adhering to the cutting board itself as the glue dries. And here's a side view of the calls. After the glue is dried, it's time to cut the board to final length. Normally I do this with my crosscut sled on my table saw, but with this board at 20 inches wide, that unfortunately wasn't an option. So instead I'm using my track saw, which is essentially a fancy circular saw that runs on a track to make perfectly straight cuts. I line the track to be 90 degrees to the side of the board and plunge the saw to make my cut. I have some rigid foam insulation board underneath the cutting board so I don't have to worry about accidentally plunging the saw into my workbench. I do this with both ends of the boards to get perfectly square corners and get the board cut to final dimensions. One of the features the client wanted was a light colored accent strip, so here I'm using my bandsaw to resaw a piece of maple to make a thin strip. Resawing is essentially when you cut the board rotated on its side so as to cut through the width of the board. I could have just taken this piece straight to the planer to get it thin, but in doing so I would waste the rest of the maple. By resawing first, I can save the rest of the board for future projects. The bandsaw leaves a rough cut mark and the strip still wasn't thin enough because I'll need to bend it uh, without it splitting. To remedy both of these issues, I could now take the strip to the planer to mill it thinner to how I'd need it. The planer bottoms out at a quarter of an inch and I need the strip closer to an eighth of an inch thick. So I used a trick where I put painter's tape on the maple, put painter's tape on the thicker piece of oak, and use CA glue, also known as super glue, to temporarily but strongly bond the two pieces together via the tape. Now I could use the oak to lift the maple up closer to the cutter head to get the eighth inch thick strip I needed. Once this was done, all I had to do was peel the tape off each to separate them. You'll see me use this trick several more times in this project. Now came a step that I've been a bit anxious about. I had to take the board that I had already spent so much time and effort on and literally saw it in half to make the space for where the maple accent strip would go. I was only going to get one shot at this and there was no going back so I was definitely a little stressed, especially since this was about $80 worth of material alone. I used the bandsaw to make the curved cut and had a white curved line drawn on the surface to guide off of. The actual cut didn't need to perfectly match this but just had to be somewhat close. Luckily everything ended up going fine. Again, the bandsaw leaves rough saw marks, so now here I'm just taking some sandpaper and smoothing out that cut line, and I do this for both halves of the cutting board. Now I could do the final, final glue up of the cutting board and glue the halves back together with the maple strip in between. I did a couple dry test fits first to make sure that the maple would bend enough at this thickness, and thankfully it did without splitting. So again, I'm using Type Bond 3 and using my table saw surface as a completely flat reference surface for this glue up. I go back and forth on the clamps to tighten the board together, and then I lightly mallet the strip down to the surface of the table saw and add more clamps and check the bottom of the board to make sure everything is looking good, which it is. After that dries, they take a block plane to the accent strip to smooth it down to the surface of the walnut. The block plane literally shaves the wood and is super enjoyable to use. Plus, it makes these cool looking shavings you'll see in a second. I enjoy using a mix of hand tools and power tools in my woodworking, and that flexibility to use either usually makes projects easier and more fun to work on. Keeping with the hand tool theme, I use a flush cut saw here to trim the ends of the accent strip to be close to even with the walnut. This doesn't have to be perfect, but just has to be within tolerance to sand the ends flat at the end of the build. After that, I now mark where the rough spots are on the board or leftover glue and go over that with my random orbit sander to get back down to the raw wood, and I do this on both sides. I also like to use a card scraper for spots like this. The scraper is kind of similar to the plane in that it takes shavings of the wood, and it's great to use to work on very specific areas like here. Off camera, I made this ugly but effective jig to route out handhold spots on the ends of the underside of the cutting board. I could then use my holdfast here in my workbench to clamp that jig down to the board itself. 
I made a line halfway through the width of the cutting board and a line halfway through the jig. And by lining those two up, I'm sure I have it centered on the board for creating those handholds. I can now use my plunge router with a straight bit and a bushing to guide off the jig to make the handholds. Take a little off with each pass and then lower the bit farther into the wood. The jig makes it so I don't have to worry about the boundaries of the handholds, as you'll see in a second. And now here's the handholds uh, with the jig taken off. The cut it leaves definitely requires some chiseling and sanding to smooth out, but overall it worked out very well. The client also wanted a juice groove in the top of the board. A juice groove is a trough that goes around the perimeter of the board, so you don't have to worry about any liquid sliding off the boards onto your countertop. You've probably seen these on a bunch of cutting boards before. Here I'm assembling another jig I made to evenly space the groove around the board's perimeter. These plywood spacers create a gap around the board, and you'll see why that is in just a second. Using my trim router, I can reference off the jig I assembled and use that as a fence to guide the bit across the board. I meant to do this in multiple passes, increasing the depth, but I accidentally took off all I wanted in one pass. Ideally, you don't want to do this because it puts a lot of strain on a router and the bit in it, especially on one this small, but mistakes happen and the groove still turned out perfectly. Do this across all four sides of the board. Next here you can see I ended up with some small but visible gaps where the final glue seam is. Time to fix that. Simply take some walnut sawdust from sanding the board and mix it with some glue until I get it to a color and consistency I like and scrape it into the seam with a plastic scraper. I do this anywhere I see small gaps and once this dries and I sand it back down you won't be able to see those gaps anywhere. Another feature the client wanted was a well in one corner of the board with a spout to pour any contents out. The juice groove would empty into this well, allowing for collection of any juices that you'd want to be saved, like for a gravy, for example. Here I have some lines marked out for where I want that to be. I had never done one of these before, so I had to think for a while about the easiest way of doing this while mitigating risk of error because messing up the surface of the board at this point would be catastrophic. Here I've put the board back into the juice groove jig and I'm using that painter's tape and CA glue trick again to temporarily affix these scraps to the surface to act as stops for the router and then make sure the stops are equally spaced to the ends of the board. I then came in with my trim router again and deepened the juice groove, this time smartly with multiple passes of the router. Afterwards, this is what I'm left with. I then remove the cutting board from the jig, remove the stop locks, and place the turned off router in the groove as far as it would go back in the deeper portion. I can then take my 12 inch combination square and use the 45 degree function to line the rule up with the base of the router. I remove the router and mark a line with a pencil where this is. I then use the painter's tape and CA glue trick yet again to put a fence where I drew the previous line and two more to act as stops for the router. I can then use the router along the fence to make the third side of the triangular well. Again, I do multiple passes until I get to the depth of the first two sides. And after that, this is what I'm left with. You can maybe see a small spot where I went just a little too far, but that's okay because I'm going to round over the walls of the well anyways later. While I got the waste in the middle, I use a chisel and a mallet to get most of it out. My trim router was already set to the depth I wanted for the well, so I didn't want to adjust that at all. This was a way more fun way to clear out the waste anyways. Just have to be careful not to go down too far. After that, I come back in with my trim router at the final depth and clear out any remaining material. I just freehand route this out, being very careful to make sure I keep a firm grip on the base in case the router tries to run away on me. With the well complete, I can now work on the spout. Again, I employ the tape and CA glue trick and place a fence 45 degrees to the edge of the board. Lastly, for this part, I use the router to create that spout using the fence as a guide. This is a little tricky because I don't have a lot of support for the router at the end of the cut, but I just do it carefully and it works out fine. I didn't get good footage of it, but I used a round over bit with my trim router to smooth out all the edges and corners of the board and then it was time for sanding, more sanding, even more sanding, and yet even more sanding. But finally it was time for what I had been looking forward to. As soon as the oil finish goes on, you can just see the board come to life. 
The maple accent strip is now super contrasted with how dark the walnut is, and I'm extremely excited to see how it looks. Some people are big proponents of mineral oil as the only acceptable cutting board finish, but I'm personally not a fan because it wears off super quickly and you have to reapply it regularly. Instead, I use a completely food safe butcher block oil that I've used on many cutting boards and never had an issue with, and it lasts much, much longer than mineral oil without need to apply it again frequently. I get all sides of the board covered, let it sit overnight, lightly sand with 400 grit sandpaper, and then put a second and final coat on the next day. And here again, you can really see how that straight grain of the walnut tricks your eye into thinking it's one solid board and not multiple strips glued together. All in all, this board ended up being 24 inches long, 20 inches wide, about an inch and three quarters thick, and weighed nearly 20 pounds. Between the size and all the extra features, this was the trickiest and most labor-intensive cutting board I've ever made by far, which is funny because typically cutting boards are a more simple and fun project. Still, I had a great time building this, and I'm immensely happy with how it turned out. I had a great time making this video and it's the first I've ever done documenting a project build. I'm sure I'll do more in the future, probably not for every project, but I truly appreciate you taking the time to watch. And if you have any questions on anything I covered here, please feel free to hit me up. Thanks again.